And I like to say right now, Mark Who 42 is proud to have 9.9 Comics as a sponsor for our show. 9.9 Comics, if you're out in Brevard County, this is one of the places to go and visit. They've just started recently, and they're located off of 1284 Sarno Road in the Melbourne area. They're starting out, but I met Matt and the team, and they are just really, really, as far as customer service is concerned, phenomenal. It's it, it's a really great store. They were telling me about a point system, Mark, and, I, and forgive me, I'm not familiar with it, but that's where the 9.9 comes from. When you go to a comic book store, some comics are just laying out there loose and for everybody to read and, and such like that. And, and every time somebody picks it up, it kind of depreciates over time. Not in this store. Every comic is protected. In fact, you can't even read the comics. They're all protected for your pleasure. So if you want to keep these comics for longevity and possibly later on try to sell them to make money off of them, they have every comic sealed up and protected. It, it, it's just phenomenal. Not only that, but one of the things I love about this comic shop is they sponsor the Candle Lighters of Brevard. Now, these folks are a nonprofit organization that takes take care of children in the Brevard area who are suffering from cancer. So if you want more information on them, go to www.candlelightersofbrevard.org if you want more information about the charity that they sponsor. And definitely go on their Facebook site at 9.9 Comics. Can't miss it. Matt and the team are wonderful. Go visit them out there and tell them that Marku42 sent you. Welcome to Marku 42 here on Krypton Radio. Yeah, you guys, it's our fifth anniversary. On April 1st, 2012, Marku 42 started out as a page on Facebook, and look where it's got us. It's got us our own radio show, our own podcast, our own apps, and a lot more to come. We've interviewed over 80 guests, at least 50 or 60 of them have been Doctor Who guests, because we are a Doctor Who show. I'm Mark Baumgarten. With me is... Zion Kiros. Zion, you're our latest addition to the show. How do you like it so far? I pretty much in, in, enjoy it very much. I really enjoy talking to you and Christian and Iggy and Patty and whatnot, and t- just talk about whole geek stuff in general. Yeah, and you get to talk to all the people who listen to us, too. That as well. Yeah. Well, we've got a great show today, in fact, and I'm going to let, well, I'm going to let our interview guest introduce himself. So hold on, and here he comes. Hello, this is the doctor. No, not that doctor. This doctor, Robert Picardo, the emergency medical hologram from Star Trek Voyager. And you're listening to Mark Who 42, and I'm on today. That's right, Robert Picardo is on today, and it's going to be a great show. Let's start out with our one of our best segments that we do here on the show, and we've got a new news person today. It's time for Doctor Who News with Zion Kiro. Zion, <laughs> what do we have? Everyone's doing news. We're, we're, we're playing uh, Round Robin here. We're letting everyone have a chance. Okay, so in the Hooniverse, we now can confirm that there is a three-parter in Series 10. Ooh. Episodes 6, 7, and 8 are apparently linked. Now, I hear that they're written by different writers, though, so... I mean, it's kind of a weird three-parter. Usually a three-parter would be written by the same person. Yeah, it's written by Toby Whitehouse, Stephen Moffat, and Peter Harness. Okay. Well, I remember when Toby Whitehouse was uh, the favorite for taking over from Stephen Moffat. Of course, that's changed now that Chris Chibnall has secured the job. But, yeah, it, uh, there are three good writers, and I... Can't wait to see it. Do we know any details of this three-parter, and do we need to hit the spoiler alert? Um, if you want to spoil monsters, then yes. Well, they introduce the terrifying monks. 
Yes, I heard that the new villain, the, the monsters were coming, were the monks. And it, it's interesting, we had the uh, the silence, which turned out to be confessional listeners at the Church of the Papal Mainframe. We have weeping angels, which, you know, are in churches and other buildings like that. And now we have monks. I mean, is this a religious show? Or <laughs> has Doctor Who got religion? The Doctor has got religion. It's it's weird. But, yeah, the monks. Oh, we had the whispers, too. But yeah, <laughs> that really fits. Yeah, these these new monsters honestly look like um, the um, headmistress from the Fires of Pompeii. The one that oh. looks very crisp. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't wait to see the new Predator. I can't wait for the new season. It's only three weeks away. April 15th on BBC, BBC America, and around the world. It's going to be great. I am looking forward to this season. I am saddened that it's Peter's last. Same here. Yeah. Hopefully the season actually goes out with a bang. Oh, I hope it goes out with a bang. Because Peter definitely deserves it. I mean, it's going out with Amandus Cyberman, so that should be exciting as well. Though Missy being part of it, I mean, I like Missy, but she already had her chance with the Cyberman. And that's where the fear comes in, where they just end up being being like a cash grab. Yeah. Just for viewers. And, and, and the funny thing is, she had a plan with the Daleks at the end of the Witch's Familiar, and... <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then she's going up with that. Yeah. All right. What else do we have in the news? Okay. Speaking of Daleks, apparently the first episode in series ten is a Dalek e- episode. Oh, oh. So maybe Missy will show up in there. Yeah. I I don't know, but that that would be cool. Do we know anything about this Dalek episode? Apparently not. They're keeping this episode very tight lipped, so they apparently wanted to keep the plot surprising for their fans and whatnot. Well, I, I like that. You know, I don't like spoilers. I, I think spoilers are terrible, to <laughs> be honest. So, I have some news that just happened. Sure. Uh, yesterday on Blog Talk Radio, on the Let's Be Reels channel, they had a very special live broadcast that Christian and myself were part of. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, we, we talked about Mark Who 42. We talked about the new BBC and ITV video on demand service in America that started about a week or two ago called BritBox. It's finally here. Interesting. The Netflix of the BBC is finally here. However, and this is the bad part, they don't have Doctor Who on it. And I thought the whole point. Wait, really? <laughs> I thought the whole point of taking it off of Netflix and Hulu was so that they could put it on their BritBox. Well, maybe they'll put it on when the new series starts, but it's not there now. In fact, there's no science fiction on BritBox. Really? No science fiction? Not on BritBox. Now, they do have a very peculiar practice with Peter Davison. They do have Hound of the Baskervilles with Tom Baker. They do have David Tennant in this production that he did in 2010, and they do have Lennon Naked with Christopher Eccleston. So they've got oh some goodness. Doctor Who representatives in it, but they don't have Doctor Who yet, and it really upsets me. They have some good things on it, but it's just not what we were hoping for, and I hope they fix it's, that. Yeah, um, I think it's... Amazon Prime that recently has Doctor Yeah, Who Amazon and Prime other... has Doctor Who right now, but really the BBC channel should have Doctor Who. It's their, it's exactly. their number two show around the world. And Well, actually, now that Top Gear is no longer that popular, uh, it might even be number one mm, now. Number one. Or, or Sherlock. But yeah, here's hoping they get the show soon. Indeed. Yeah. Okay, so... Also in news, scientists are close to creating a real sonic screwdriver. Get out of town. Yeah, physicists from the Australian National University announced that they had created a prototype of a handheld device that would be able to analyze objects' chemical properties. 
Wow. So it so it's not opening doors, but it's definitely scanning stuff. <laughs> Can it detect anything with wood? It does do wood. It, it actually does, does do, do wood. wood. Well, it so they've improved. They've, they haven't improved. They they they, re- they didn't improve on the opening things, but they improved with wood. That's good. <laughs> A best description of it is that it's very close to the idea of an MRI image of, mm-hmm. of a single molecule. So that's yeah. actually really, I mean, that's impressive. Yeah. So we talked last week about the new trailer of Doctor Who, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. But another company dropped the trailer this week, uh, Justice League. Oh, um, my goodness. I am not looking for... I. Just not. I don't like the DC movie universe. I don't like it. I'm a fan person of giving everything a try. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to end up watching it regardless. So you're going to pay the $12 to go see Justice League. I never said that. I ah, said I'm going to watch it regardless. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, now, I'm just... Uh, as far as I can tell, Superman's not in this movie. Well, and they don't show him in this in the trailer, but I, as far as I understand, he comes back at the end. I don't know if that's true or not. But you can't have a Justice League movie without Superman in general. Yeah, well... How do you have a, a, a oh, whole movie without him? Justice League in the comics has had different lineups, and there have been lineups without Superman. So Yeah, I mean, of course, but to the general populace, Superman is the definitive leader. People who oh, yeah. don't read the comics, Superman is the mainstay of the Justice League besides Batman. Well, yeah, and and having ba- Ben Affleck as Batman just... They're just rushing into that whole cinematic universe, trying yeah. to compete with Marvel, but it's actually buying them in the ass. Yeah, and it's a different flash. I like the fact that Marvel keeps the TV and the movies all together. Having a different flash just... I like yeah, exactly. the flash in the TV show. Why do I need an improvement? At the same time, they're going to be they're going to be the flash at the same time. Multiverse. Uh, oh, oh yeah, that's true. Multiverse. Uh, you, you've yeah. heard of Red Nose Day, haven't you? Yeah, of course. Red Nose Day is a charity event in England. They have a special telethon every two years on the BBC. Lenny Henry was the one who started it, and back in 1999. Back in March of 1999, Stephen Moffat wrote a special episode of Doctor Who called Curse of Fatal Death. Oh, Lord. That thing. Yeah, and (laughs) it's been on the net. It's been around. People can find it. Well, in honor of the anniversary of Red Nose Day being this month, and it's a skip beer, the BBC YouTube channel released Curse of Fatal Death. It's there for you to watch. And it was great. Rowan Atkinson was the doctor, or was he? Because, I mean, Jim Broadbent was the doctor. Well, no. Uh, uh, Hugh Grant was the doctor. No, no. Uh, uh, Richard E. Grant was the great intelligence. Oh, no, he was the doctor. No, no. Uh, Joanna Lumley was the female doctor. I, yeah. We've had a female doctor written by Stephen Moffat. It's already happened. Technically, we did. We we had that. So <laughs> you you can catch that. Just type in the, the Curse of the Fatal Death comic relief special, or go to the BBC channel on YouTube, and you can see it. It was very funny. It's hilarious. They, yeah, and and they had Julia Swahala from Absolutely Fabulous as the Doctor's companion Emma. And it had Jonathan Price as the master, and all oh, those Dalek bumps. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no more we can say on a family show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Doctor Who is coming back. It, you know, like I said, the new show three weeks away, and it's incredible how uh, I've been reading all these articles on the new series, and I can't wait. Neither can I. The one thing that I'm definitely looking forward to, which I've said on the show before, of course, is that I want to see how they're going to write in the uh, villains. Mm -hmm. 
And seeing that since the first episode is a Dalek episode, I'm pretty sure that that's where the Movellans are going to yeah, come in. Yeah, yeah, the Movellans from Destiny of the Daleks. The Daleks equals in terms the, of intelligence. They sense. couldn't fight each other. They were kind of at a standstill. A stalemate. A, yep, a stalemate, like World yeah. A stalemate, like World and the Movellans got the Doctor to try to win the war, and... The Daleks brought back Davros to try to win the war. Which is a very interesting concept. Silver dreads in space. Okay, so now, in more news, we have a new captain for Star Trek. Yes, we do. Jason Isaacs, also known as Lucius Malfoy from Harry Potter, (laughs) is the captain of the USS Discovery in Star Trek Discovery. But it would be, I honestly feel like it'd be a, a bigger headline if the captain was the main character in the series. Right, he is because the main character. Number one mm-hmm. is the uh, main character, the female second in command. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, now, like, look, speaking of discovery, right? Yeah. This takes place in what? Like, before Kirk takes some of the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. And have you seen how the discovery looks? It looks like the Ralph McQuarrie concept art from uh, the motion picture. <laughs> But, like, my thing is that, oh, of this time frame, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost certain that the main line of the Federation was the Constitution classes. Right. The non refit Constitution classes. And this thing looks nothing along those lines. It looks like something out of Voyager, but that's just me. So, how do you feel about this whole series going on so far? Well, you know what? I, unlike a lot of people, really liked Star Trek Enterprise. And I love the opening. The- the opening is great. I, no, I love the whole show. I love all four seasons. I thought the first two could have been better. I liked the fact that season three was all one story. That was kind of cool. And mm-hmm. season four with the arcs worked for me. I thought the writing was good. I thought the characters were good. The character interaction was good. But the loyal Star Trek fans, it seems, didn't. And complained every which way about it, and the ratings didn't work. Because we were saturated with Star Trek, having had three series before it all very close together. And right. So Scott Bakula was a great captain, and I think Jason Isaacs could be a great captain, too. Oh, most definitely. He he definitely has the um, acting ability to bring his abilities to, to the captain table. I just am really worried about how they're going to go about this whole plot. Well, That's it, what it comes around to. What concerns me is they're only going to show the pilot, the first episode on CBS, and then everything else you have to pay for on CBS All Access. Wait, really? And it'll be on Netflix in England and maybe in Canada, I'm not sure. But here in America, we have to pay for it. Unless, well, we won't talk about that. But <laughs> we're doing a lot of that today. <laughs> We're doing a lot of the not talking about. I'm kind of optimistic. I, I think we, we've we needed a Star Trek show back on TV. I'm hoping with the creative team that they've put together, with the actors they're starting to announce, I'm hoping for a good show. But you're right about the ships. The Constitution class was the major ship design that they were going with, and they're not going with that. No, I think they're doing that because they didn't want it to look like the USS Enterprise and people would get confused. Is this Star Trek or Star Trek? So, (laughs) Right. Yeah. But I I don't like the way the ship looks. I I think it looks like a model that a 10-year-old could make. And I I would say that honestly. I would joke that that Star Trek ships actually look like pizza cutters. But this one actually looks like a pizza cutter. Yeah, it does. It does. You know, I actually used to have one of the Enterprise pizza cutters. <laughs> Just proving my point more. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, they'll make money selling pizza cutters then. That's good. Uh, <laughs> wow. Five years of Mark Who 42. This is our fifth year, and it's going to be a doozy. We've got Robert Picardo coming up. Do we have any more news? No. All right. So, you know what, then without a doubt, let's take a little break, and when we come back, we are going to have Christian Basil, who is not here today because he's celebrating 
his wife's birthday. And he interviews Robert Picardo, the doctor from Star Trek Voyager. We'll be right back after this on Krypton Radio. Don't go away. Don't go away. We'll be back with more Mark Who 42 after this. Mark Who 42 is proud to have famous faces and funnies. This is a huge mega comic book store. I mean, they just have literally, literally tons and tons of comic books, novelties, everything. They're located off of 3020 New Haven Avenue in West Melbourne. And if you want to give them a call and just let them know, Mark Who 42 sent you. It's 321 259 3575. But this thing is just a huge. I, I mean, you've seen comic book stores and nothing against them but you've seen them you know these tiny little shops and they have comic books and they have merchandise and memorabilia and such like that this place is like the uh, the best term i can put is the costco of comic book shops you go from one store and there's another section and it's just huge they have funkos they have tons and tons and tons of stuff in there I, i mean it's hard to explain but if you have any geekdom out there famous faces and funnies have got it covered for you from Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars, everything. And also Rick is the guy who runs it and all the team over there, nice, friendly people. And I believe they're going to be joining us at Megacon this year. So definitely want to check out our friends at Famous Faces and Funnies in the West Melbourne area if you're out there. Coming May 19th to the 21st, Oasis 29 continues to celebrate excellence in science fiction and fantasy. Oasis 29 will take place at the Sheraton Orlando North Hotel featuring special guest writer Faith Hunter. The best way to see Oasis 29 is with your three-day weekend membership pass. Your pass will include full admission to all the art exhibits, dealer rooms, guest speakers, writing panels, and of course, a special appearance by your favorite Doctor Who podcast, Mark Who 42. A con suite for nourishment will be available on site. For more information, hotel rooms, and purchase for your tickets, including student discounts, go to www.oasfis.org slash oasis. Oasis 29 is an event that promotes safe and fun environment for the entire family and upholds that cosplay is not consent. We look forward to seeing you there. The voice of Christian Basil, take one. Hi, I'm Christian Basil, and I would like to provide my voice for all your voiceover needs, such as... Okay, like an announcer. Like a what? Like an announcer. For all your voiceover needs, such as animation, radio, announcements, introductions... Now an old man. I can even record voicemail for all the mashuganas that call you. A pirate. Arr, and it won't cost you a lot of treasure for me services. Arr. A creepy movie voice. Just call 407-761-2679. 407-761-2679 or email voice of Christian Basil at yahoo.com. Well, how was that? That's a wrap. This is Tom Pike, co-creator of the science fiction series Personal Space, and I am wishing Mark Who 42 a happy fifth anniversary on the airwaves. Welcome back to Mark Who 42, taking you to the Hooniverse and beyond. And we have a terrific guest here today. Ladies and gentlemen, we have from, well, gosh, uh, a plethora of movies to choose from but you know him best as the doctor from star trek voyager ladies and gentlemen mr robert picardo how you doing bob i'm doing well thank you christian i consider myself the doctor with no name from the american franchise not the british franchise the doctor from the future with no name Awesome, awesome, awesome. So there is a crossover. There's a certain crossover. I am simply called the Doctor. It's really my fault that my character was simply called the Doctor on Voyager. Originally, my character was supposed to become Doc Zimmerman by about episode number four or five. Right. And uh, very shortly before we premiered um, the show in January, I think, of 1995, I said to the producer, do you intend to uh, list me in the opening credits from the, you know, from the first episode after the pilot as... Doc Zimmerman, he said, yes. I said, well, we're doing this whole storyline, you know, as as to whether or not my character being an artificial intelligence could have the freedom to choose his own name. I said, if we tell the audience what my name is going to be, what name I'm going to choose, aren't we kind of killing the suspense? And he smiled. He said, you're right. And they changed the opening credits just like a week or two before we went on the air. And because of that, I, in that moment, ripped off 60 years of British science fiction television. (laughs) That's quite funny you mentioned that because I remember when I first saw Voyager and I read the credits and it said Robert Picardo as the Doctor. And I was thinking to myself, 
wait a minute. <laughs> Who the hell do they think they are? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going like, whoa, well, okay, this is a change. We have a time traveler inside Star Trek. So I, I was, I was, I was uh, very happy. Well, just to show you the spectacular depth of my ignorance about science fiction, I didn't really realize that. I didn't, I, I knew of Doctor Who, but I just didn't know or didn't occur to me that he was, of course, famously referred to simply as, as the doctor, doctor and you never knew his name. And I'm sure the producers knew that we were stealing from your franchise, but uh, I certainly didn't know. So mine was an innocent theft at the time. Now it's um, completely cognizant. Now, everybody who is in sci-fi knows you well from everything under the sun. I mean, there, there, there's a ton of movies. In fact, I was, I accidentally came across a movie. Not, I shouldn't say accidentally, but I came across because I was looking for Christmas movies, and you were in a Beethoven sequel. And there, yes, <laughs> I, I would characterize that accidentally coming across one of my performances. <laughs> hey, I was looking um, for yes, good the movies. dog walk, working with Beethoven was difficult. You know, um, we, we had a female Beethoven, I think, in some of the scenes. And I want to tell you, uh, that was odd, uh, having a female double for a male. That's what I recall. But Beethoven normally, of course, is a male. And you can certainly tell the difference, of course, in a dog that size. It's tough working with a dog. You know, they have a, you know, they got the dog got the biggest trailer. There was an endless stream <laughs> of bitches waiting to go in the trailer. It was, oh you know, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a come down to work with it in a movie with a dog starring, but, uh, but I did enjoy myself and, and the first day of shooting, I recall, was 40 degrees below zero, oh, God. which is the crossover point between Celsius and centigrade, a, a scientific fact that you never want demonstrated for you firsthand. It was very cold. Wow. But yes, it's a, I, my performance is, I would call, I was painting with a very large roller in that performance. <laughs> now, speaking of what you, I, I mean, anybody could find you in almost everything, but my take is on this. The Planetary Society. Oh, how cool. I'm glad you brought it up. And I wanted to know, specifically, me growing up in Florida, I grew up with the space shuttle in its infancy when it started with Atlantis and it kept going, and then, unfortunately, the shuttle tragedy. And I think through osmosis of being close to the space coast, have a very deep passion, and that reflects into, into the podcast, into the sci-fi world. But I want to know your passion about space. Well... I grew into a passion about space. Some people, I think, have it like you do as a young man. I, I was really brought to my passion about space by working on Star Trek because Star Trek has such an inspirational influence now on two generations of people that often go into science, technology, space exploration, theoretical physics, astrophysics, whatever. Right. That they watch Star Trek when they're young and they develop an interest in it. Certainly, if they're captivated with the doctor characters, they may go into medicine, whatever. Star Trek's inspirational friendship with NASA has gone on a long time, longer than I've been involved with the Star Trek franchise. But once I did become involved, I suddenly found myself in the company of what I used to call the realies, <laughs> the right. real people. I, I sat on stage with five moonwalkers in Huntsville, Alabama, at, at a celebration of Star Trek's 30th anniversary um, wow. back at, at, at Space Camp. And once you've met these people, these explorers or the engineers, the mission planners behind these great, great things that NASA has done, mostly happening, you know, during my lifetime. Well, of course, all of it. NASA was formed in 1958. So mm -hmm. and I was born in 53. So the amazing accomplishments that have happened in space exploration during the time that I've been on the planet. But the fact that the Star Trek franchise brought me in contact with these people and to see up close their courage, their um, sense of calm in any uh, situation when they recount dangerous moments or moments of pressure or sitting on the launch pad for hours during all the final systems checks before they launch. I mean, these experiences firsthand have what have what uh, engendered in me my love of space. And I am deeply grateful for my experience in Star Trek that, that it's put me in the company of these amazing people. And an extension of that is my involvement with the Planetary Society. Back in the, uh, uh, in the uh, latter 90s, shortly after Voyager went on the air, 
the two surviving co-founders at the time of the Planetary Society, Carl Sagan, we had lost at far too young an age, but yes. the two men, his two uh, two colleagues from uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Dr. Lewis Friedman and Dr. Bruce Murray, reached out to me to become a member of the advisory board of the Planetary Society. They recognized that as a Star Trek actor, I had contact with a science fiction audience, many of whom were already big space fans or perhaps could be coaxed into being big space fans. So they saw me as a, you know, as someone that would help them reach the science fiction audience and to help teach them that if you love science fiction, chances are you love science too and you love the real strides we're making in, in exploration. So I have I worked for years uh, as an advisory board member, often with educational challenges for young people. Something called Red Rover Goes to Mars. And when we landed the very first rover on Mars, there was a program the Planetary Society sponsored for high school kids to build their own rovers made out of Plegos. And they would uh, build a Martian surface in their high school, build their own rover, send their rover over to a, another <laughs> high school. Yeah. And they would explore the other high school's Martian surface that they had not built and had not experienced and collect data and transmit it home via the Internet. And the other school, meanwhile, would explore their Martian surface with the rover they had sent over. So it was a perfect model for what we were actually doing, what NASA was actually doing in space. But right. kids could compete uh, in, in this particular. And then there was another project that the Planetary Society sponsored called the Mars Millennium Project. And I talked our Star Trek producers into shooting what I believe to be the only public service announcement ever shot on a Star Trek set where I talked about this challenge in the PSA. And just a few months ago, I was emailed by a young PhD in astrophysics who said that having seen that public service announcement, which she was about 13 years old, made her realize that that's what she wanted to do with her life and that she entered the competition and that she ended up, you know, getting her doctorate in astrophysics. So that was a very gratifying moment for me that, you know, that there had been some direct results from some of the, uh, you know, efforts to uh, in 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 reaching out, trying to get young people interested in science, technology, engineering, medicine, mathematics. What do you think we'll hopefully find out there eventually? Well, as uh, as Carl Sagan famously said, I'm now only paraphrasing, but it's, you know, we are one tiny little speck in, in this enveloping cosmos, the Earth, the Earth, and, right. and it's and he, and he characterized it, I guess, as arrogance of the human species to assume that we are we're the only ones here. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but. It, it is. It's in when in in the enormous scale mm -hmm. of things, and and our pale blue dot, as Mr. Sagan referred to that famous picture taken by the Voyager spacecraft from about sixty billion kilometers away, that our little speck is the only place where intelligent life exists. Is when you think about it, downright arrogant and improbable. So how and when we will make first contact. I really couldn't say, and it, it would be amazing if it were during my lifetime, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to happen sometime. I'm, I am convinced, and there may have been, you know, there's some those that believe we've already had first contact made. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't know, but, but uh, it's a great big universe, <laughs> and perhaps one of many universes. I find it interesting that you had mentioned that because I, I and forgive me I, I actually did some research where there was somebody who had a theory that if there were extraterrestrials or life on other planets then either we would have discovered them already or they would have discovered us what do you say to people who have that belief? Well I would say they could indeed have discovered us and we're just unaware of it that's the likelier possibility if we have discovered them and it's been kept a secret from the world's population at large by, you know, concerned governments who think we'd all freak out, that's something that certain conspiracy theorists believe. <laughs> Area 57, am I, do I have the right number? Area 57? 51. 51. 51, forgive yes. me. I'm always trying, no, always trying okay. to make something okay. bigger and better. <laughs> uh, well, it's Area 51 plus inflation. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, there you go. I don't. I don't know. I think it's entirely possible that we've been detected. Did you see the 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 movie Arrival? I have not yet. I have not. Very but- thought provoking. I recommend it. I've heard nothing but great reviews on that there. Mm-hmm. And I just want to let our audience know that if if you want to know what Bob and I are talking about, go to planetary.org. And there's this wonderful place that you're going to be visiting called the Planetary Society. And you can actually see a video, which I, I was happy to see, which is an excerpt of Pale Blue Dot, a book written by Carl Sagan. And uh, Bob does a beautiful, beautiful job of uh, uh, doing an excerpt from it and all uh, all of the images that you see. And I do believe that Carl Sagan was way ahead of his time. And yes, I think he of thought they. of a universe beyond what we could see and imagine. Because when I grew up sci-fi, we saw the universe through the eyes of a writer who interpreted through a story using emotions from actors. And every time that we get a new image from the Hubble or from Voyager... And we see it back. We see the actual universe the way it is. And I know this sounds kind of weird, but I'm hoping I'm making sense. But does it feel like the universe is writing a story for us that we have yet to get to? Does that make sense? It not only makes sense, it's a, I think it's a very interesting way to put it. So I will not mess up your statement by, <laughs> by, by trying to I thought I it. messed it up. <laughs> no, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, just to go a little bit further, I uh-huh. do a monthly newsletter called The Planetary Post. It's free to subscribe to. It's about uh, every month. About a, uh, uh, There's about five minutes of video. It's embedded in a newsletter where if any of the things that I'm talking about as to what's happening in space right now, if any of those topics interest you, you can, you can read about them and for, at much greater depth – from the incredible bloggers that we have at the Planetary Society. We have a woman named Emily Lakdawalla, who is one of the most knowledgeable people on the planet about all space exploration, not only history, but what's happening now. And you can just stay up to the moment by, um, by reading her blog, by following her on Twitter. And uh, we have other bloggers as well that are experts and are, and are quoted. I mean, uh, the other day, one of our bloggers the journalist from the Washington Post was going on to our director of development at the Planetary Society, how they love Jason Davis is his name, loved reading Jason's work. So it's an extraordinary, um, you know, this, the Planetary Society is a space advocacy group, the largest and I believe most important one in the world. And it basically empowers the private individual to feel like they have a hand. Mm-hmm. in space, in, in space exploration. You have a voice. Planetary Society, to my knowledge, uh, have sponsored and created the first privately, I mean, citizen funded. I shouldn't say privately funded because there's obviously, you know, there's private enterprise in space. But I mean, citizen funded spacecraft, the light sail two. We had the test of the light sail one was very successful and the light sail two will be launching sometime between now and fall of next year on the Falcon Heavy rocket from SpaceX. It is a solar sail, Mm -hmm. and the craft will actually accelerate through the pressure of sunlight. It's it's something that Carl Sagan proposed on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson with a little model of it back in the 80s, and now about 36, 37 years later, you know, his vision will come true. Now, what's going on with Orion? Because I remember there was a big hoopla about that, and then I haven't heard much about it. Yes. Well, um, I, I, I don't have any further information than you have heard. Uh, we are talking about the competing heavy launch systems. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know it's funny. You do, you do sort of hear more about SpaceX. Orion is the, is I, the one that I, uh, I believe is the, it's from the joint, um, Lockheed Martin mm-hmm. and McDonnell Douglas right. creation. Um, yeah. Um, I don't have any. Uh, I don't have any. Remember, I'm a cheerleader for space, not the most knowledgeable. No, person. no, no. But that's fine. Want, I, I, I can I, answer this question. <laughs> if you want to know what's happening, you can go to the Planetary Society and read Emily's blog. I guarantee you, she'll tell you. No, definitely there, Bob. This is this has just been a wonderful talk, and I, I'm. I, I, it's very rare that I have somebody who comes on here and actually geeks out about space, who's actually <laughs> kind of worked in the space in in some form or fashion, and and the legacy of Gene Roddenberry to carry on throughout the decades is just a testament to his ideology that humankind has a chance to be better and to explore better and that we have a vast future ahead of us speaking of a future 
what projects are coming up down the pipe at this moment? Well, um, yesterday I was shooting with another actor from science fiction, the beautiful Katie McGrath, who's on the Supergirl series. For years, she was on the British uh, series Merlin. Uh-huh. She played my wife, if you can believe that, in a, uh, a movie that Kate Winslet is producing. It's a family movie. Uh, the lead character is, I think, a tw- 12-year-old girl. I know it's a very young girl. I think she's 12 years old. It's called Buttons, the movie. Oh, okay. Buttons, the movie. And I play a, a sort of a robber, barren uh, textile mill owner from the uh, very early 1900s. And I have a young, beautiful trophy wife uh, who's quite, <laughs> who's, who's not very nice, <laughs> played by Katie McGrath, who oh, is herself very, very nice. And it was a a pleasure, first of all, for a man my age to have such a beautiful young wife, even in make believe, <laughs> was uh, it was a, it was a vicarious thrill for me, as you as you might imagine. I think we're just and, all happy uh, I we was, have one. <laughs> I was working on that this week. I I've, I've worked recently on the CBS all digital platform. Will not only feature the new Star Trek series, one of the other original programming series it has will be a kind of a spin off of The Good Wife called The Good Fight. I guest starred on that very recently. Earlier this season, I was on uh, Salem, the show set in uh, colonial times oh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. about witches that uh, is produced by Brad and Braga, my old yeah. uh, Voyager boss. I uh, have also appeared this season on Lucifer, and I'm having a run on playing, uh, uh, it seems like, uh, characters with accents. Earlier this past year, I was in uh, the Coen Brothers' Hail Caesar playing a Jewish rabbi. So I'm playing, I'm doing a number of accent parts as well. <laughs> so it's always fun to be a character actor because you get to live so many vicarious lives. But I do have to admit, I have a soft spot for the vicarious lives uh, that involve young trophy wives. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes with perks, you see. There you go. That's what I mean. <laughs> Normally, I don't get to kiss people. In fact, in Lucifer, all I did was throw up a couple of times, too. So... You know, it's the good and the bad. It's either uh, if you're going to play a character that is sick and, you know, getting sick on camera, yeah. or would you rather have the beautiful woman standing next to you? I guess just don't get the two roles confused. Let's put it that way. <laughs> or would you rather freeze <laughs> filming a dog film? So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Bob, it was a pleasure and an honor having you on the show. You are more than welcome to come back any time you'd like. Just let us know. And, I will uh, come back. You were very patient uh, since we first spoke at that event, you know, arranging schedules to get me on. So I thank you for your patience. I've enjoyed the conversation. I'm particularly glad we got to talk about my involvement with the Planetary Society. Uh-huh. And I encourage all of your listeners to go to www.planetary.org. Please subscribe for free to the Planetary Post so you'll get in your inbox every month a little video newsletter for me telling you what's cool and what's going on out in space. And just in case, folks, you can also visit markhu42.net. We will have the link on there when this episode premieres on uh, on our series. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you very much, Robert and Christian. Wow. Okay, so remember, we will put the URL for the Planetary Society uh, that they talked about on the markhu42.net description of the show. So you can definitely find out more about it, get the newsletter that Robert was talking about, and keep up with the space program. The space program is important. We need, need to go back into space. Very, very important. I'll definitely say that much. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about upcoming conventions and appearances. We've got two coming up in the next two months, possibly more. We haven't worked them all out yet. But the one that's coming up this month or next month, depending on when you're listening to this, April 14th through 16th at the Miami Airport Convention Center is Supercon Retro. Zion, you'll be there. Yes, I will. With the Mark 42 team. Christian will be there. Patty, oh, Patty's doing a lot of Q&As with the guests. Dan Harris is going to sit in on uh, a panel with us. Dan Harris, formerly of Omnicon and also the head of the Sci-Fi Sea Cruise, which is the Doctor Who cruise that they do every year or two. Uh, It's been going on since 1988 when I went on it. It's going to be a great convention, and Mark Who 42 are running the Doctor Who panels. You know who's going to be there? Who? Ingrid Oliver. Osgood. Osgood is oh, coming. Yeah. To uh, yeah, 
Yeah, it, oh, I cannot wait. It's going to be great. There are a lot of other guests coming. Nicholas Brendan from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is going to be there. Gigi Edgley, who we've had on the show from Farscape and Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge, she'll be there. Noah Hathaway from the original Battlestar Galactica and the Never Ending Story will be there. Lori Petty from Gotham and Orange is the New Black and Tank Girl, she's going to be there. We even have David Yost from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and that's kind of scary. Uh, Peter <laughs> David will be there. Peter David is a great comic writer and, and author. You've read some of Peter Wait, David's work, Peter, haven't you? Yep. Peter David with the, um, I've, I currently am reading Spider-Man right now, and I just got past the um, Death of Gene the Wolf, which is his mm-hmm. masterpiece. Well, have you read the Grey Hulk stories that he wrote with Mr. Fix-It? I've only read, like, three of his works, but the one I that, 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 that I read was um, Hulk the End, which was a really uh, good that piece. That was good. He, he's also written novels like Sir Apropos of Nothing and The Road to Wooin and a lot more. Who else is going to be there? Gothic Sushi, our friend, and... Of course, like I said, we're going to be there. It should be a fun event. If you want more information, you can go to floridasupercon.com slash retro or go to markhu42.net. Look on the right side of the page, and there is a link there for that. And if you sign up now, you can save 15% off with the promo code RETRO15. It's good for general and VIP admission only. I'm not sure how long that's going to be going on, but it's only online ticket sales for that. So you definitely should go there. I am going to be there on Sunday, Saturday night, because it's April 15th, and that's the big premiere of Doctor Who, and in America, the premiere of Class, Episode 1. We are going to have a screening in one of the rooms on a giant screen TV, and then afterwards, we're going to record a live broadcast. And yeah, recording a live broadcast. That's kind of awesome. Of, of us reviewing the two stories, and we're going to have audience participation. You and the audience can be on the show telling us what you thought about episode one, and we're going to actually play that on the following week's show during our review of episode one of Doctor Who. So it should be exciting. And I'll be there on Sunday with the Doctor Who Invasion of America panel and the Whovians Anonymous panel that we seem to love at Supercon. (laughs) We love that battle. So be there or be obtuse. I thought it was be square. Well, I like triangles better. How about be acute? Be, well, if you're acute, well, but be there or be cute, that, 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 that <laughs> sends the wrong message. Sends the wrong message. Being obtuse is bad. Okay, uh, in May, Mark Who 42 will be attending Time Gate Presents Who Lanta in Atlanta, Georgia from May 5th through 7th. And you know who's going to be there? Who? Colin Baker. Yeah, oh, wow. we had him on the show. Nicola Bryant, who will be on the show for the next two episodes. In the next two episodes, we're going to have a two-part interview with Nicola Bryant, so stay tuned for that. And Camille Kaduri, who plays Jackie Tyler on Doctor Who. And writer Jamie Matheson, who wrote such great episodes like Mummy on the Orient Express. That's a great episode. He's going to be there. It's going to be a fun convention. At both of these conventions, Mark Who 42 books will be there, and we'll definitely have Big Finish audios. Because Osgood's going to be there, we're going to have some unit new series audios that you can buy and then get her to autograph. And at Hulanta, we'll have some Colin Baker and Nicole Bryant stories, as well as all the latest Big Finish items for you to buy there as well. A happy anniversary, man. It's five years. Can't believe it. Five years. Five years. Five years since we opened the page. And I remember, because it was on April 1st, that we had to warn people, not an April Fool's joke. We're really <laughs> starting a Facebook page. And we did. 
And, you know, look where it's gone. It's gone to us doing convention appearances. It's gone to us getting big-name guests. It's gone to getting us on Krypton Radio. And some other big news that we still, we were hoping to announce to you today, but we can't because it's... The, the 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 signature hasn't been signed on these two things and we were we were hoping we were hoping they'd be ready for today <laughs> but uh it's gonna be a great fifth year and we plan to keep going way beyond that here in mark who 42 so zion do you have any final words to say this has been a short show but you know with everyone a, a patty is on assignment. He's doing a convention in Jacksonville, Collective Con. He got to interview Margot Kidder and a lot of other people. And like I said, Christian's taking the wife on the birthday extravaganza. And Iggy is, uh, well, you know, she's getting close to giving birth and she just wasn't able to do today's show. So, Indeed. Yeah, so, but you know, just us, Zion, that's fine. We do a good show. Very much so. I think the show went well today. So we're we're giving you a kind of short episode, but any final words? After this season, I I really want a break from the the, the Daleks. I know they probably will not because that's their main thing, but it just really would help as a refresher to to see a a whole season without the Daleks, like they did last season with a whole season without the Cybermen. And the only thing about having no Daleks is then the people complain, we want Daleks, where are the Daleks? But, you know, when there are Daleks, why are there Daleks? There are too many Daleks. So Exactly. I, so people never get what they want. The grass is always <laughs> greener. It really is. Ah, don't forget, go to markwho42.net and join the Hooniverse Army. Go to our Facebook page, markwho42. Tweet us, at markwho42. Go to Tumblr page, markwho42. We're all over the net. We're on Florida Geek Scene. We're on TuneIn Radio. We have an app. We have an app for both the iPhone, iPad uh, stuff and the Android stuff. You can find them at the Google Play Store and the iTunes Store. And we're on Roku, where you can listen to our shows on your giant big screen TV with just a logo on the screen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you don't get to see us. We... We only make our appearances at conventions. You want to see us, you got to come to a convention where at. Then you can say hi to us and we'll say hi back. And we, we <laughs> do have fun at these conventions. Conventions are definitely fun. I am looking forward to this year. After Nicola Bryant's two-parter, we are going to spend 12 weeks reviewing the Doctor Who season. We'll have a few special things, including having Jeremy Raddick back, Gareth from the 1996 TV movie, will be helping us to review some of the episodes because, you oh, know, gosh darn it, he likes Doctor Who. He's always liked it. It's part of the reason that he got the job in the Doctor Who TV movie. So he'll be coming around. And then after that, we'll have a lot more interviews in the summer and we'll be doing a lot more convention appearances as well. On behalf of myself and Zion Kuros and our other co-hosts, Patty Hawkins, Christian Basil, and Iggy Matthews, we want to say, Allons-y! You'll hear us next week. Bye, everyone. Mark Who 42 is written and presented by... Mark Baumgarten, Christian Basil, Patty Hawkins, Iggy Matthews, and Zion Heroes. This episode was edited, directed, and produced by Mark Baumgarten and co-produced by Christian Basil. Visit markwho42.net where you can register and become part of the Hooniverse Army. We can be contacted by email at mark at marku42, subject line, question mark. Space Coast Comics is a free monthly magazine found in over 120 locations currently throughout Brevard County, parts of Osceola, Belusia, and Indian River County in Florida, and soon to be available in Chicago. Follow them on Facebook to learn more. 
Doctor Who and its properties are owned by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. If you'd like a chance to be a guest on our radio show, send an email to our media relations director, Christian Basil, at marku42media at yahoo.com. Owned and copyrighted by Mark Baumgarten 2017. This is Krypton Radio.